Hey, everybody. It's an uh, amazing honor for me to be here. Just want to give a shout out to my daughters right there. Yeah. So, what do I want to talk about? Well, this is it. There is goodness in the world. How do I know this? I do not, except within myself as a set of private experiences that make up some working theory of life. And what is that theory? It's this. We are all secret solitudes working out our philosophies of the universe based on purely personal feelings and sensations. We all seek the guidance of internal compasses, private illuminations, that shed light on the darkness, the unknowability we live in. These private illuminations allow us carefully, tentatively, but sometimes with great power and purpose to move through the world. If that is true, I appeal to my own such experiences in the hope that they might invite your own, my own personal feelings and sensations as they relate to being here at UVM, to my time on this campus when I was an undergraduate between 1981 and 85. Three memories coming to me now but never having left me either. Memories that have always been there as constellations that make the space between the far stars less meaningless for me, that make me feel less alone. First memory, I would study up there on the fourth floor of Williams Hall and sometimes on brilliant fall days, I would look out the window and stare across the lake to the far shore where there was a farm, a red barn, a copper roof, a green field. The farm must have been huge to be so clearly visible from so far away. I would look at this farm, look at the clarity of the lake between me and it, at the colors, the big green field, the copper roof, and the sparkle of the sun and feel without reason, without explanation, not in any way that my textbooks could tell that there is goodness in the world. Second memory. I'm in this building behind me, Waterman, on a cold winter night in a darkened classroom, watching a movie with my classmates for a Shakespeare course. The movie is Henry V, it's from the 1940s, it's in Technicolor. And moving across the screen are medieval knights in armor on horseback, knights and horses in blue and yellow and red and white. But what I see is not this illumination, the one on the screen, but the reflections of the horsemen on the windows of the classroom. There they were, painted on the double darkness, the dark of the room and the dark of the night, floating there in that darkness as if their colorful pageantry took place outside the room. Not in it, horses, armor, and men suspended, actually weightless in midair. I watched these phantoms play at their separate reality and thought, again, without reason, without rationale, that, and here I seem to change my terms a bit, there is beauty in the world. Third memory, I'm vacationing in Vermont, in Middlebury, out visiting from St. Louis, Missouri, where I grew up. The year is 1979, I'm 16, and I'm spending time with a friend, a student at Middlebury Union High School, who shows me his high school yearbook. And I'm looking through the pages, staring at a photograph of the girls' track team. And I say to my friend, who is that? Who is that girl? Pointing to a, a young woman standing and smiling in the photograph. And he tells me, and I said, well, I'd like to meet her. And I don't meet her. And I forget about it. And three years pass. So cut to me now a sophomore at UVM and I'm at a party talking to a girl. And I go away to get each of us a drink and as I return to where she is standing, I suddenly realize that it's her. It is the same girl from the Middlebury photo and I go back up to her and say, 
hello, I know who you are, and I explain, <laughs> and I explain the story which she had heard about. And we end up going out. And though it does not last beyond a few dates, <laughs> we're different. She likes the Grateful Dead, and I don't. <laughs> she, uh, Phoebe is her name, is a really good person. And I thought then, as I think now, that chance encounters like that one sometimes speak to secret unities, a quiet in the universe and a quiet in us. And this feeling when it arrives is fragile, like it's going to break apart at any moment. Goodness, beauty, quiet, it's the nature of these things that they seem impermanent, fleeting. So another Vermont story, this one about fragility. It's the summer of 1985, just after my graduation. It rained on mine, too. And I'm spending the summer in Burlington working for um, Domino's, <laughs> delivering pizzas in my brown 1976 Saab to that great pizza-loving region known as Mallets Bay. And at the end of that summer in August, I agreed to house sit at a place not far from here, at the end of a dirt road called Lost Nation Road. House sit and kids sit, actually, because the house is that of my friend and his wife, and they're away with their two teenage sons, um, Luke and Eli, in my care. So out behind the house at the end of Lost Nation Road, is a lake, and one day, seeing a little rowboat on the shore, I decide to go out in the boat, alone, without a life jacket, even though I could not swim. And I figured to myself with some odd logic that it was a test, that I needed to be brave, and that the day and the lake being perfectly calm, it was not such a big deal. And Eli, one of the boys, saw me there and asked if I wanted company or if at least I wanted to wear a life jacket, but I said no uh, in both cases, and I rode out into the middle of the lake, far from the shore. That was part of the bravery, the test, and I stopped there, letting the boat float, quiet in the warmth and haze. Nothing happened as you may note by observing me here still in existence. <laughs> but what I think is this, that Eli, the boy who, in asking me about the life jacket, kid sat me rather than me kid sitting him, who showed himself wiser and saner than me, that a few years ago this Eli died suddenly, a young man still in his 40s, which made me recall the boat the lake, the haze, as if, and maybe my memory plays tricks on me, he actually did come out with me on the lake that day. Even now, even right at this podium, I cannot be entirely sure. And I think we all float, all of you, me, these people back here, we all float weightless on the heavy surface of the world, suspended in dreams of who we are. And these moments of good, of calm, which I believe all of you have had in some form, are completely delicate. They're moments when the world you find does not devour you, does not drown you, but instead raises you up, keeps you afloat, buoyant, in some strange awareness of the fragile balance of being alive. These moments are delicate, but I've also noticed that they're indestructible. And maybe they're even the most indestructible part of us. So another story. I'm in California with our younger daughter in a secluded forest through which a clear stream runs. It's a perfect stream, 20 feet wide, 20 inches deep, rocks and gravel, uh, bright at the bottom. 
shimmering in the flow, sun and shadow playing through the branches of the overhanging trees. And my daughter and I spend some time there, who knows how much, time stops, it slows down. My barn, my field, my shadows, my calm, the kindness and sweetness of the world is a secluded realization of love, a balance or pause in which we sense, I don't know how to put it, a joyous secret that is always there for all of us but is only occasionally made so vivid and so real. That reality trembles and disappears, that is its nature, it lives only in moments, but yes, it is also indestructible. Hate and wickedness cannot touch it. So consider, later that same day, the day of the clear running stream, but now back at the hotel, I opened my email and received a message from a source I'd never gotten an email from before, that is the U.S. Justice Department. And this email announced that after three years, the first arrests had been made in the murder of my younger brother, who had been killed in prison in 2014. My younger brother was a drug addict, a person who started using cocaine in the 1980s when that drug was the drug of choice and who my brother never got off it and the lying and sociopathic and self-destructive behavior that goes with it. I could say more about this, but let me just say here that it's an American tragedy of a common kind. I am afraid. But that day, with this new news confronting me of the arrests of the men accused of beating my brother to death of, yes, the cruelty and depravity of the world, I noted that the clear stream still ran, that in fact it was not changed in the slightest by this poison, this toxin. Nothing ran through it other than that water's accustomed clarity and its accustomed peace. Worthless, I have heard that peace called, and I am sure I will continue to hear it described that way. And you know what? The haters come in two stripes, two shapes. One kind is made up of those who live perpetually in worlds of facts and figures, demonstrable proofs and claims, most often tied to money, for whom the idea of a man staring at a stream with his daughter on that or any day is truly a worthless phenomenon. Worthless, that is, unless some financial gain can be squeezed out of it. The other kind of hater is the kind that says, and let me see if I can say this right, there is no time for that. And let me see if I can say it right again, this time another way. People are suffering. Injustice goes on daily, hourly, by the minute. You need to do something, not just sit there and stare. Never mind that in this feeling I have described all mean egotism vanishes, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, that all mean as in average, ordinary egotism vanishes, and that all mean as in mean, nasty, harsh egotism vanishes. Never mind, too, that Emerson said that it is from these moments that the qualities we all want, that we all, you know, pay lips, lip service to, but in fact are very present in us, the qualities of wisdom, and virtue and beauty spring, never mind that these qualities come from these moments. Instead, in the words of this second kind of hater, and let me see again if I can paraphrase it, you are a walking, talking example of privilege, 
of the gratuitous pleasures and peace that only those with money, means, financial, social, educational capital can achieve. And you know what? I draw the following conclusion from these kinds of hate. There is something about goodness that the world does not like. And I mean goodness in the sense of the calm and quiet and beauty that I'm talking about now. It's threatening somehow. So once I was at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., quietly reading the Gettysburg Address as Lincoln's words are inscribed there in stone, in the delicious shadow of the cool within the memorial, when I was startled out of my contemplation by a little boy who, sneaking up behind me and in effect screaming boo, evidently thought that no such form of quiet as was my own just then was tolerable to a mind like his already forming its estimations about what does and does not matter in life. Or another time, I was on a big airplane flying back to San Francisco from New Zealand. And it was at night, and I was looking out the window at the stars of the Southern Hemisphere. I'd never seen them before. And as I did so, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the flight attendant motioning with her hands. And I thought she was only asking if I wanted a cup of water. And anyway, I was all too enthralled by the stars, which blindly, in a kind of braille, I was reproducing in ballpoint pen dots on a blank paper before me, making my only, my, my homely connect the dots chart of the heavens. So without turning from my window, I said to the flight attendant, no, thank you, I I'm fine. But after a while, I sensed that she was still there and in, that, in fact, she was now mad at me. Pull down your blind, she said. People are trying to sleep. I looked outside. It was dark. I looked inside the plane. It was dark, save for the hundreds of individualized screens that made a great glare before each passenger's face. And I concluded that the flight attendant felt that I had violated the pact, not of darkness and not even of light, but of our mutual agreement as a culture, as a society, that we not look outside, that we not ask big questions, that we not marvel at the very fact of being alive, at our smallness in the scheme of things, which we blindly, like me that night, try to draw to the best of our ability in a simple language such as this here I speak. And that instead, as compensation, we politely enjoy the rich, bright entertainments placed before our individual faces, the diversions, as they are called, to which we daily, you all as much as me, outsource our imaginations. It seems like self-help, doesn't it, what I'm saying, like a treat, a gift, a special form of awareness, like it's almost nothing more than a fast, a cleanse. But what I'm talking about here is not the yoga of a movie star. This is not up here a new line of products or a corporate rollout uh, in the latest wares of mindfulness. That's not what I'm talking about. But at the same time, it is not some philosophic treatise requiring us to retreat to the library or the desert or to both to suffer the great torments to mind and body that only the, the especially wise acquire. Instead, I name a quality that all of us here possess, and you know what, all the time. It is this quality of goodness in ourselves and the world manifest in just these fragile but indestructible moments we all experience. 
Yes, we learn to doubt this goodness, to repress it as of no account, even to hate and ridicule it within ourselves. Plenty of times, maybe most of my life, in fact, I have been my own flight attendant, my own jeering boy at the Lincoln Memorial. We hardly need the world's external censors of our goodness since we already efficiently internalize the prohibition against this nameless, weightless, utterly personal feeling in which we miraculously see the world and ourselves as we are. Like on a brilliant day here in Vermont, when the lake is blue or silver or gray, I sense all the boats that have ever floated on it, the schooners and sailboats and dories and side wheelers. I feel all the times that have been. And I'm down among the fishes some hundreds of feet deep, there with the blips on the fishermen's sonar screen that are the schools, the living creatures that for a while remain living still. And I'm in some Adirondack Valley where a fox eats a mouse, the fox tilting its head back, the better to bring the back teeth into play. And I'm at our near shore, looking at the moonlight glinting off the leaves in the trees, off the faces of the lovers as they kiss. I am all of these things. You are, too. Thank you.